I'm Commander Ken Entignap, and during the Falklands conflict, I was on board HMS Ardent. We knew that we were being targeted. There was a big, a huge explosion, and the ship shook. The lights went out, water started pouring in. I shouted, go! I knew that there were injuries up top, and I was knocked unconscious and was trapped. Am I going to survive this? I didn't want to die. I'm only 28 years old, I think. I joined the Navy in 1970 as an artificer apprentice. I worked all the way up to Chief Petty Officer. And in 1982, I was aboard HMS Ardent as one of the section chiefs. And my action station, I was the uh, uh, chief in charge of the after damage control. I was pretty familiar with the, the ship, familiar with the routines, and we were um, a pretty practiced bunch of people. Ardent was, was late going down. Um, we didn't sail with the task force because we'd been in some rough weather um, in, the, in the February time and we'd uh, caused some damage which had to be fixed in Devonport. So we were a few weeks late going down. Of course, always watching the news of how the, the situation was developing. You, and every hour you get an update of what's happening around the world. Um, we were always rushing back to the, the mess to listen to the, um, the news. Uh, I don't know if you know that Lily Bolero is the um, uh, theme tune, and every time I hear that, uh, you get tingles up your spine. Um, so we were constantly aware of what's going on. We were all call, recalled off Easter leave early in order to start manning up, ready to go um, to the, down south with, with, and catch up with the task force. No, nobody wants to go to war. Nobody wants to go to war. We want to have peaceful outcomes to all of the conflicts that start. And we thought that a show of force would be sufficient enough to back the Argentine people down. We were issued with these dog tags, they're fibre. Um, and on one set, you have your blood group and your name. On the other, you have your rank and your religion. Um, and on the other set, you have the size of your uh, uh, well, your CB suits, your chemical suits. And you got a piece of string, but a hairy string, and you dangled that round your neck. The other ones had a shorter piece of string which goes round your toe if you end up as a, um, an in, uh, a corpse. Um, Ardent was the first ship to go in uh, between uh, uh, the two islands. Uh, we went past the entrance to Count St. Clair's Water, and our role was to set up a gun line in Falkland Sound and uh, to keep the aircraft on the ground at, at Goose Green. Uh, we had to wait for the special forces to get in their positions to give us the call for fire. Um, that was a bit of a long wait, uh, but when it came we were a bit relieved that we were actually doing something at long last. And the gun started um, bombarding uh, the shore and uh, we did that for most of the day. After we'd finished the bombardment, we were told to move further out into the sound. And we knew then that we were going to be a, um, a decoy um, out there. So um, we were in for it, yeah. I think the seminal moment was when um, Sheffield was hit. And you realised then that it was uh, for real. Uh, I remember the first lieutenant coming down. He was very quite pale and he said, just seen them, he said. Big green things. Um, and we'd been, we had a bomb on the side of the ship that hadn't exploded at that time. So um, we knew that we were being uh, targeted. Uh, and you, we knew then that we were going to go into some sort of action. So that point when you start thinking about yourself. And certainly as a person in charge of a, a group of people, and they were all looking at me to lead them. I think that reconciliation with what I had to do helped me later on in the, in the day. Uh, so you have all these things. People write their letters home, you know, their final letter home. And uh, you start thinking about that sort of thing. But 
all time doing that, you are um, conscious that you have a job to do, you've got to do it well, you've got a, a commitment to the ship. All the time um, we were being told to take cover as aircraft came in. We knew, well I knew that um, the, the call to take cover at this time was a little bit more dire because of the the intonation on the Office of the Watches um, called across the Tannoy. There was a big, a, a huge explosion, and the ship shook, and the lights went out, water started pouring in, and the ship gradually moved over, um, heeled over uh, to starboard. Um, as soon as the bang went, um, I shouted, Go! Um, and uh, luckily everybody did. <laughs> um, what had happened, the bomb had gone off in the hangar. There were people up there fighting the fire that was in the, in the hangar. I think by that time the helicopter had been blown overboard and there were some serious injuries up there. Um, I didn't at that time know there were any fatalities. I could see some people with field dressings around um, their heads and, and their arms and things. So I knew people had been injured. I was sufficiently trained to get uh, the priorities right. Um, and in many ways, you're, a, you're secretly grateful to do something. You're still pretty frightened. You're not just pretty frightened, very frightened. And you don't want to do anything wrong. But you see the people around you, and it's good in yourself that you're directing them to do the right thing. So I, I think that was how I, that's how I dealt with it. Uh, I can remember saying, come on, Kenny, you've done the Petty Officer's Leadership course. You know, where's that extra 10% that you were, you were taught to give in those in PLOC? So at that time, I thought we were going to get the ship back operating again. That was my f sole aim. We had to get the ship fighting again. Um, has the propulsion system uh, been incapacitated? Can we steer the ship? All these things um, come into mind in how you have to address them. After the second bomb had gone off and I was knocked unconscious and was trapped, unable to move, um, pinned down by something which crossed my back, and I could see that I was, I was injured, I could feel that I was injured, um, we were having a lot of difficulty breathing. I, I, I don't think I really thought about must get this ship back working again. I thought, how can I save myself? And you realise that perhaps the ship isn't going to get back into a fighting condition because of the amount of devastation that you, you can feel around you. When I came to, I saw that my hand was, was all mangled up. I thought, well, never mind, they can sew fingers and things back on these days. I, I couldn't see so well because of the mess up that was happening up here. I had a big cut here. Um, you know, I was feeling a bit groggy. Um, and then I, I tried to get up and, and crawl away, but I couldn't. You try again, still can't do it. And you assess, now, what do I do? Try harder. That extra 10% I was talking about, try harder. I still couldn't get out. At this time, the compartment is filled with thick, black, acrid smoke and starting to have difficulty breathing. At that point, you start thinking, oh, how am I going to get out? Am I going to survive this? Am I going to die? Um, I, I certainly thought about the missus and, 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 and the baby. Um, you think, God, I, my, my wife is home. She's five months pregnant with my first child. Now, I want to go home. I need to see. I want to be there. So you try harder. Um, but luckily then I heard somebody coming um, across the dining room and he, he, he stopped at me and he said, are you all right, Chief? Um, so I'll get this off my back and we'll get out of here. And then we grabbed hold of each other and we tried to go forward, but we couldn't get over the debris that was there. We couldn't, f couldn't see it, couldn't feel it. 
Um, so we moved um, into the middle of the dining room and we just cuddled each other, thinking, what do I do now? What happens now? You don't say anything to each other. You just grab hold of each other tighter. And then we got a waft of fresh, got a waft of fresh air. <laughs> um, from, and then, then you could, I could see the flames of the fire and behind the fire, fresh air. Um, so clearly the, the, the ship's side had been blown away. Uh, at that moment, I thought, we can survive this. We're getting some air. The after door wasn't there. There was a hole in the bulkhead. There was a lot of mangled mess over the top of it, but there was a gap underneath it. It must have been 18 inches wide. Um, neither of us would have got over it. We'd have cut ourselves to bits in the, um, in the, in the debris. So I said, look, we'll get underneath there. We'll get through there. And he says, we'll not get through there, Chief. So I said, um, being a leader, I said, follow me. <laughs> um, so we scrambled underneath this 182 winch and got ourselves into the open air. Um, and we put our life jackets on and jumped in the water. It was about six o'clock in the evening um, when we were finally, uh, when we finally abandoned ship. We didn't have time to put our once only suits on um, and that we were in there just in overalls. That was giving us a chance to live, uh, sort of. Um, how did uh, Rick Jolly said, out of the frying pan into the freezer, is how he described it. Then the helicopter came over, the, the old Wessex, and chap came out of the, um, the winchman came out, came down, picked John Dillon out of the water and came back for me. The relief came when I was flopped on the, the deck of the, the Wessex and I heard um, Commander Jolly say, get these people to Canberra quick. I went out cold at that point. I came to in the Canberra. I was wrapped in blankets, no clothes. Um, my head and arms and things covered in uh, field dressings and I had a lady lying next to me. I thought, is this heaven? I realised later on that they were under attack as well and all taken cover. And the lady it was somebody that worked in the, in the laundry there, had come out and worked to, as an orderly in the, um, in the ward. And then slowly um, we were transferred to the, uh, the ward. People started coming up to, say, to see us because they tell the tale that when they were um, taken onto the, to Yarmouth, they went down to the mess decks and did a head count. And of course, I was missing. Well, at that point, they start mourning. It's not the bereavement for, for somebody who's not there, all the people are not there. They naturally assumed that they may not have survived. So um, when they realised I'd got out, they were um, quite uh, eager to come and chat, see if I was all right, you know. Um, I was lucky coming back because I was different. People could see the difference in me and they, they knew. Um, a lot of the guys that weren't injured and have no visible uh, injury had trouble. And we start seeing um, post-traumatic stress syndrome um, or disorder being part of the media. And lots of the guys had these issues. And, and one of the things I am, I am uh, eager to do these days is to help people in, in that area. And I think that the HMS Ardent Association that we formed is one of those key elements that still keeps us together as a, as a unit. It started off as just a, a group of guys that wanted to have a couple of beers here and there. Um, we had a, um, an annual reunion uh, and we've had one ever since. You only need to meet once a year, have a, you know, have a cuddle with whack of pain and a uh, couple of pints of beer, and you're set off for the rest of the year. But knowing that there are people there, 
um, it helps you. So important these days. It's such a wonderful feeling to be part of it. Um, later on when we got back to the UK, I was handed a, um, a brown envelope and in it was uh, what I had in my overalls pockets. My diary, um, some keys, uh, some stamps and 67 pence. And um, I've also got in my little ditty box there um, a piece of shrapnel that was pulled out of my head um, some months after the, the Falklands. So, so that and the anchor are the only things above the surface at Edgeworth's Island at the moment. <laughs> now, we um, had a fouled anchor in Portland Harbour um, a few months before we went down south. So you just drop it and leave it there. And it was subsequently pulled back up again a few years ago. And it's now in the National Arboretum as the Ardent Memorial. Yeah. Little reminders. Coming, coming back, um, we had to get through the, uh, uh, the inquiry. Um, so we were all in HMS Drake and called forward for interview. Um, during that time, I was going into uh, uh, Stonehouse Hospital every day for um, physiotherapy to get my hands working again. Um, I still had the middle finger when we came back, but uh, sadly they couldn't save that. That had to be amputated. Um, I was finally discharged from that, um, and then it was back looking at your career. Um, I got myself promoted, ended up as a commander. So I, I know that's that's me. I wanted to carry on in the uh, in the navy, and I was pensioned off at the end of it all. <laughs> there are a couple of things that um, um, that, that hinder me. You know, um, I can't do little things very well. Um, I can't play the flute, but I never could. So it doesn't really matter. And you know, it, it's, it's there. Sometimes it still hurts like hell. But a little bit of me that says, yeah, well, you know, I survived. I should still suffer because. Looking back, I think that we, um, we weren't particularly well prepared for the amount of devastation that we'd seen. I, it was one of the things I, I, I think about today. Now, I, if I realised I wasn't that injured, I could turn around and maybe done some better things. Yeah. You know? um, but it's it's one of those things that you you, you, you tend to grapple with yourself all the time. Um, but I don't think we could have saved that ship on that day. Not with what happened. Felt like Clint Eastwood then, going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>